You're standing on the frozen shore of Ross Island, a rare spot of ice-free ground. This year, the sea ice stretches 40 miles north, a three-day walk for a hungry penguin. It's nesting season. Many of these Adelie penguins have been huddling over their eggs for a month without food or water. Their chicks will hatch next week. Behind you rises the bright cone of Mount Erebus, the southernmost active volcano on the planet, 12,000 feet high and crowned with steam. Mount Erebus straddles three worlds, the thin sea ice that is home to these penguins, the volcanic rock they need for their nests, and the thick floating ice of the Ross Ice Shelf. Antarctica is a shifting world of ice, rock, and sky. The ice moves, pouring downhill in slow motion. Mountains steer the ice into glaciers and ice streams. And an ice shelf forms, where ice from the land flows into the ocean and begins to float. On the other side of Mount Erebus, the ice shelf stretches to the horizon. It's easy to forget that this is not solid ground. Orange bags of survival gear dot the ice, required when you leave the safety of Ross Island. Behind you, a line of buildings marks the airfield. On the edge of Williams Field, a tent holds the Rosetta Project. A group of researchers trying to map the structure of the Ross Ice Shelf and the hidden seafloor underneath. My name is Kirsty Tinto, and I'm the scientist leading the field team for Rosetta. This rack tent is the heart of our operations. It's just like transporting our lab and our offices from home and putting them on the edge of an airfield at the far end of the world. Antarctica is a long way from spare parts, and the tent is lined with supplies and equipment. My name is Nick Frearson. I'm a lead engineer on the Rosetta program. So here we are in the rack tent. Grant and Dave are just setting up the gravity meters for the first flight of the day. The gravity meters are are interesting devices. They they measure tiny little changes in the Earth's gravity field. So if you fly over a big mountain, you get a little change in Earth's gravity. And when we fly up and down in a grid over the Ross Ice Shelf, we uh, slowly develop a map of the seafloor underneath the shelf. The sun won't set for months so Rosetta can fly night or day, whenever weather and flight schedules permit. These gravimeters are these fantastically sensitive instruments, and in any other uh, life, no one will be allowed to breathe near them. And here what, what we do is we pick them up and drive them across the Ross Ice Shelf, and then stick them in the back of a, a large aircraft. This plane is the city of Albany better known as Skier 91, the largest plane that can land on skis. The loadmasters deal with everything in the back of the plane. And so we are very much in their hands uh, when we load our equipment onto the plane. They make sure everything is very secure for us. Here you see the gravity meters on their pallet being brought into the aircraft and chained to the floor so that we know that they're in the same position they were in yesterday and they're not going to move. It's a big plane, but space can be tight. The center aisle is piled with tools, equipment, and survival gear. We're in big coats, so we're all about twice the size that we're supposed to be, and uh, that helps to fill up the plane as well. Once the pallet is chained down, 
engineers behind the plane survey its exact position inside the cargo hold. Another set of instruments is already mounted on a hydraulic arm near the back of the plane. This is IcePod, a flying science lab. From the end of the runway at Williams Field, Skier 91 is a faint rumble in the distance, taking off for an eight hour flight over the ice shelf. Over two Antarctic summers, the Rosetta team has made two dozen flights over the Ross Ice Shelf. So when we're mapping the Ross Ice Shelf, we basically were flying backwards and forwards like mowing a lawn. But this is a lawn the size of Texas. Now the Ice Shelf acts like a plug. If something happened to this plug or part of it, the glaciers and the ice streams flowing from the land into the sea will start to speed up. That's like dropping ice cubes into a glass and the water level rises. The direct consequence of that is sea level rises. Propellers carve spiral contrails from the low cloud. Above the clouds, Mount Erebus and Mount Terror appear beneath the bright summer sun. Look down. Ice pod is mounted to the left-hand rear troop door. If you look out of the bubble window, you see that the ice pod is mounted on an arm. And for takeoff, the arm is raised up. Then once the aircraft has taken off, the loadmaster comes back and can lower the pod on the arm. And if you look out of the window, you can see that happening. Inside the pod, half a dozen instruments will peer down at the Ross ice shelf. The low clouds thin and clear, revealing a band of dark water. In the distance, the bright edge of the Ross ice shelf a 100-foot wall of ice stretching 600 miles across the Ross Sea, the edge of the unknown. The cliff that we can see is about 100 feet high, so that means a 1,000-foot thick ice shelf that we're about to fly over. It is just an amazing experience as you cross that shelf edge. You're out over the uh, open ocean, and then you cross this just totally pristine shelf. Some of this ice has been floating for a thousand years. As it's traveled, it's been snowed on for a thousand years and had the wind blow over it for a thousand years and had the ocean circulate underneath it for a thousand years. And so it's, it's built up a lot of history. The East Antarctic ice sheet is a high plateau, miles of ice piled on mountain rock. But the West Antarctic ice sheet pushes down into the sea, and its base sits on the ocean floor. Warmer waters moving under the Ross ice shelf might erode the ice sheet and threaten its stability. If West Antarctica collapses, it could raise sea levels by 15 feet. Data from the ice pod flows into a rack of computers inside the plane. Engineers monitor the instruments in flight, looking for problems. We spend most of our time basically standing watching the monitor, which is showing us these fantastic snippets of information from what is going on underneath us on the ice shelf. It's just amazing to be able to see this hidden world underneath through the, the eyes of our instruments. Above the ice shelf, flat white extends in all directions. The monotony is broken by huge crevasses. You look out of the window, you can see this enormous crack that goes off into the, almost to the horizon it seems like, and it is basically a, a stress crack. The ice is always flowing. When it's on the ice shelf, it's stretching. Here, close to the front, it starts to fracture, and what's going to happen is that it will carve into icebergs and float away. Hours later, the plane reaches the ice shelf's southern boundary, the Transantarctic Mountains. The scale of, of Antarctica is so amazing. These mountains are, are maybe six or 7,000 feet high, but they just look like these little line of hills almost. 
uh, covered in snow and covered in ice. We just have no idea of the scale of the place. It is quite uh, phenomenal. The Rosetta program, we can only do it with the support of the New York Air National Guard and the C-130s that they fly. This is um, a little bit different for them and I, and I think they quite like that. At least for the first uh, you know, 200 hours. <laughs> Logistics and support are provided by the National Science Foundation, which runs McMurdo Station. Look down. This is McMurdo. It's a small town on the edge of an entire continent, and uh, there's a population of about 900 people, including the scientists who are there in the summertime. You really get to see how a town works, what it takes to support a community living here in a really hostile and remote part of the world. Very little is known about the ocean currents that flow under the ice shelf. Airdrop floats will plumb the depths and measure temperatures from the surface to the sea floor. The pilot looks for a patch of open water while the loadmasters prepare to drop the first float. We deploy this instrument, and when it breaks the surface, it sends an email. So when we launched the first float, by the time the plane had returned, I had an email in my inbox that told me the temperature and the salinity of the water. So I knew they'd been successful before the plane had even landed. After an eight-hour flight, the ice pod is raised for landing. The plane's shadow skips across ice and cloud and finally touches down, back at Williams Field. Terabytes of data will leave the plane in a suitcase. The forklift returns for the pallet. If the scientists are lucky, tomorrow will bring another flight. The season in which you can do this kind of science in Antarctica is quite short. We're measuring a complicated system, and we're using a cargo aircraft, and we're operating in Antarctica. So there are a near infinite number of things that could go wrong. When the Rosetta project is finished, their data will feed into models of the future and help predict the unknown. So we're on a planet of connected systems. We know that Antarctica is changing. We know that the sea level is rising. We know that West Antarctica is losing ice and will continue to do so into the future. We know that that's going to raise sea levels around the world and affect what the coastline looks like over the rest of the planet in the next 100 years. We don't know how quickly that's going to happen, and we need to have more accurate maps and models. Like, I love the fact that we are filling in the map. We're going out there and making measurements to try and understand the planet. <laughs> 